integrated pest management, which is kind of a convoluted topic, but it's something that I, I feel is important. It was developed for row crop agriculture as a way to reduce our dependence on pesticides, but because we have all these different treatments and things that I've been talking about, I just wanted to kind of cover this real brief. So it's, it's an approach to pest control that's sensitive to the environment that our bees are in or, or whatever agricultural environment, everything, you know, and, and what we're putting into the environment and also the economics of the situation. You can spend a lot of money on products that you're not gonna use or not gonna get a lot of use out of. And everything that you put into a beehive, every time you open a beehive, we're really disrupting a, a very a very complex environment in there. There's a lot of communication going on that has to do with odors and, and the way things are organized. And, and a lot of these products are gonna disrupt that. So we wanna reduce how much we, we really mess with what the bees are doing. So it's not the same as organic pest control. We can use a lot of the same tactics, but uh, we would still consider these different types of pesticides as, as part of uh, IPM. And, we say the M in IPM is for management. We can't eradicate these pests. If we could, we would have already done it. I personally would have done it if it was possible, but usually by the time we know an invasive species is here, it's usually too late to do anything about it. But if we can manage them, keep them down to numbers that, that will not really affect our, our beehives and our honeybees, then uh, that's the best option for us. So we want to take all the different tools that we've been talking about and we want to integrate them into an approach that's going to be the most effective and the least intrusive situation and solution for the problem at hand. So talk about cultural controls. These are things that you as a beekeeper can do, the way you manage your bees. Uh, these are pieces of equipment and, and modifications to the beehive that we can use that don't have any chemical bases. It's not a medication, but it's something that can help us. So mechanical traps and, and things like that. Prevention. Someone asked me earlier, is there a way to prevent instead of treat? Prevention is going to be the, the best thing we can do, but it's one of those things that's easier said than done. It starts with good beekeeping practices. When you scrape some burr comb off, don't throw it on the ground. That attracts wax moths, right? So uh, keep your hives in good condition, good repair, so you don't let the wax moths in and the small hive beetles in. Keep your hives healthy and strong, and they can repel a lot of these opportunistic species. Screen bottom boards help a little bit, it's not a silver bullet that you can rely on, but you also need to worry about, that's a, an entrance for small hive beetles to come in. Um, the, the different traps that keep the adult beetle populations down, those can help. Uh, genetic controls. If you are using bees that are, are genetically, uh, you know, reared to, to be resistant to diseases and, and to be more hygienic, to get rid of some of the the other types of pests, then, then that's a step in the right direction. And chemical controls. We can use these different medications and things when we need them. So we keep an eye on what's going on in our hive, how many mites do we have, how many beetles do we have, and we can take this step when we need to, but we want to start with highly targeted compounds that are low toxicity. Some things have a, a broad spectrum toxicity. They'll kill anything. Some things are much more targeted, and so that's where we need to start. But if we need to move up the scale a little bit, sometimes then, then we have to do that if, if the things that we're doing uh, haven't, haven't had the control that we need. If you look at a the year with your bees over time, the number of pests is going to go up. So looking at varroa mites, they start out low and they just keep going up indefinitely. As long as there's brood in the hive, you're going to keep manufacturing varroa mites. At some point, that's too many mites. So the, the terminology calls this the economic injury level. Well, that's, you know, that's for row crop agriculture. What's, what are the economics of a beehive? A lot of us might be doing it not as a business to try to make money, so we're doing it as a hobby, it's for fun, we're, we're not trying to necessarily uh, make a living off of this, but still there's economics involved. You had to pay for those bees you got, you had to pay for those beehives. If you let that hive die, that's $150, $200 to get more bees to put into it. Below this level, 
you know, the cost outweighs the benefit. You can go out and buy all those medications we talked about and put them in your beehive. There's no mites in there early in the year. You're kind of wasting your money. You're wasting your time. You don't need to do that. But if you wait too long, then the benefit outweighs the cost. You definitely want to spend four or five dollars on a little tin of, of thymol crystals rather than spending $180 on, on a new nuke next year because you let your bees all pass away. So, you know, there, there's definitely sense to it. What we need to do is find that threshold number. How many mites is too many mites? Well, too many mites is up here. So we need a number down here that tells us this is where we put in our, our treatment and we can knock down that number of mites, hopefully, for the rest of the season. It will start to creep up again later. That's just the cycle that we're gonna be on, but we wanna keep it as low as possible in a reasonable way. So the question is, how many pests can a, a colony handle? And that's not an easy thing to answer because it depends on the time of year, it depends on what else is going on in the, hi uh, the hive, you know, any other diseases or health problems that compromise it. Um, you know, how many bees do you have and, and what's the weather? That determines the flowers outside. The better the weather, the more flowers, the more food is coming in, the more they're feeding the queen, the queen lays more eggs, and a colony can outrun a varroa infestation for a long time. It's when the food starts to run short and then the, the bee population starts to drop and that's when it gets really critical. And of course the genetics of, of the hive, we kind of talked a little bit about that. So sampling for varroa mites is real key in determining where your colony is at any particular time. Does that hive have a problem? Chances are they've got some mites. Even if you just bought bees a couple of days ago, wherever they came from, I'm sure they gave it a spring treatment because the, the bee farmers wanted a good reputation to have healthy bees. But there's a very good chance there was one or two mites in that package or in that nuke. But how many does it have compared to the overall population? And how many can it handle? So a little colony can't handle so many. A big monster colony, they can handle a lot more without be becoming overwhelmed. So what's the most effective method to handle the, the situation? You know, if you have one fly in your kitchen, you're not gonna call an exterminator and have the entire house fumigated. You can use a fly swatter. If you've got thousands of flies in your kitchen, you probably should find another place to hide that dead body. Then call the exterminator, right? When you want to sample for varroa mites, you can use powdered sugar. There's some other methods, but this, this is one that a lot of people are using. And you can uh, get a just a regular old canning jar, the kind that you can take the lid out and leaves that metal ring. And this is all in your handout. Uh, it goes over this. So you want some eighth inch mesh. This is kind of the standard for beekeeping is eighth inch hardware cloth. And you get another container. Light color works best. You'll see why here in a minute. And you'll need about 300 bees. A quarter cup is about 100 bees. It doesn't take much. And 300 is a really good sample. Some people do, do 200, but I, I like 300. And you've got to get them somehow into your jar. So uh, some people will take a, like a plastic tub and you can take a frame and you can brush or shake all the bees into that and then take your measuring cup and just scoop them out. If you're gonna do this method, uh, take a, a comb that is got open brood on it because those are your younger bees, your nurse bees. They're more likely to have mites on them. And if you're using a comb with open brood, what some people do is they'll give it a good hard shake like that and all the bees just drop off. But if you're using open brood, remember you've got tiny little larvae that are stuck in that little pool of royal jelly in the bottom of the cells. And you give it a big old knock and now you've knocked them over. One thing about bee larvae is they only breathe out of the spiracles on one side. And if you flip them over, they're gonna drown. If you knock them off of that, that orientation they're in, they're stuck in that little gooey pile, but if you knock them over, you're gonna kill them. So don't knock them around too hard. Take your bee brush, brush them all down in that pan. If you count to 15, all the older bees fly out. The younger bees, the nurse bees, sit there for a minute thinking, what's going on? I've never been in this room in the hive before. This is crazy. Then you can knock them all over into a corner and, and scoop them out. But you'll be sure to get more young bees that way. Some people shake them onto paper or like a little piece of metal, 
things like that. You can also get a just get some kind of a measuring cup or, or something like that, this little plastic box here, and, and you can just scoop them right out. But my favorite method is to use a jar, and if you go down, take a comb, and just roll it right down the back of the bees, they'll all do backflips right into the jar. You, you can pull a comb out with one hand, and you can do it with your other hand. You don't even have to, to put anything down. So if you take your jar that you're gonna use, Measure out three-quarter cup of water and draw a line on that with a magic marker, a Sharpie, permanent marker, and then empty it out and dry it. So now you know exactly what three-quarters of a cup of bees would be. So use this method and just roll them in there, tap the bottom of the jar so they all settle, make sure you got enough. If not, give them some more. But uh, this is cap brood, but I would use uh, open brood to do this. He was just demonstrating, but this is the best way to get bees in there. Put the lid on real quick. And then give them a couple of tablespoons of sugar. Just push it right through the screen using your very fine measuring tool there. And then roll it around. You don't want to hurt them, but you do want to coat them all. People tell you don't sugar coat it. In this case, you do. You want to sugar coat them all. Now, when you get all these bees sugar coated, they're not exactly happy. They start grooming themselves and grooming each other, and in the process, it knocks a lot of the mites off. The mites also can't stick to the bees really well. There's also a lot of humidity in a jar full of bees, especially in August in Arkansas, so the sugar may start to clump together. But after about 30 or 40 seconds, turn it over and shake all the sugar back out, and this is why you wanted another container. This one, something shallower would be better than that. Don't do it on top of the hive because a gust of wind comes along and you got to start all over. But shake, shake, shake all of that out for at least a minute. Then release the bees. They're alive. They're not happy. But you dump them right back out into the, the top of the hive and close it up before they know what happened. You can also dump them out uh, at the entrance of the hive. They'll walk back in. The other bees laugh at them, but they get over it. It's not going to hurt them. Uh, but you can actually shake them pretty hard. They've got exoskeletons. It's not going to hurt them too bad. But then you go back and you count all of those little mites. And almost probably 90% of the time they land on their back like a turtle with their legs kicking in the air. And you can see them because they're kicking all of the, the sugar off and you just count them all up. There's other methods to, uh, to sample for mites. Um, this one is from a French company, and this is a little uh, CO2 cartridge you put in here, and it's got a needle like you'd inflate a basketball with. And this line is 200 bees, so you, you get your bees in there, you put this little plastic lid on, and you squirt carbon dioxide in there, and it knocks them out. This is what they use to anesthetize queen bees for artificial insemination, so it, it's not supposed to hurt them if you don't use too much. If you give them too big a blast, I've done this before, the, the lid just pops right off and uh, it's probably a little too much pressure for them, but they drop right down, you shake them around, and this screen right here, you collect all the mites down below. And then you just take those bees, you pour them right back out into the hive, put them in the sun, they warm up and, and in the fresh air. In no time they come to and they look at you like, that was really weird, and then they go back to work. One thing about knocking bees out, <coughs> is they throw up the contents of their stomach so they will be sticky and so i find that you don't get all the mites so i usually double the count of mites if you if you find three mites count it as six it gives you a much better uh count of of what you've got uh, they, you can also use alcohol uh, this is probably the most accurate method to assess the the mite numbers and you can make your own shakers. This is two peanut butter jars and there's some screen in there. Or you, they make all kinds of homemade ones that you can count up the mites. But this is probably the most effective tool for counting mites that I've ever used. It's called a, a Varroa Easy Check. It's this plastic uh, cup and inside um, there's this, this white part. It's got all these holes in it. There's lines that you can count two or 300 bees. So you get your bees in there and then you drop it in and it's got alcohol and you just shake it really vigorously, all your bees are dead, which is sad, I know, but 
If your colony can't lose 300 bees without being in danger, that colony's probably not gonna survive anyway. You shake it around and then you swirl it and these little holes are angled just right and all the mites fall down into the bottom and they're really easy to count. If you've got that many mites on 300 bees, that hive is definitely in trouble. So hopefully you're not gonna have more than about nine or 10 mites in there. That would be enough to, to trigger a, a intervention. But this is easy. You can, uh, you can strain the, the mites out and you can reuse that alcohol several times but it's cheap, it's effective, and uh, one of these will last you for years and years. Another way to sample for mites is to use that screen bottom board. Uh, this is kind of a, an older method. It's not really as effective, but you can put that insert in. You may wonder why it has this grid on it, and that's so you can count. It's a lot easier to count one square at a time than to try to count uh, just a big empty white sheet. Uh, they do make them that have glue on them, like flypaper. You can slide in there, or you can take this plastic one. This is like that sign board they make real estate signs or political signs out of. In fact, after uh, the election cycle is over, you can pick these up anywhere and just spray paint them white and cut them down to fit. But usually your screen bottom boards will have a groove where you can slide this insert in. But uh, you slide your sticky board in and you leave it in place for three days because your, your might fall, your natural might fall, is gonna be kind of variable, but three days is a pretty good average. Any less than that, it's not gonna be real accurate. Any more than that, and there's gonna be so much debris on that sticky board that you're gonna have a hard time determining what's a mite and what's just a little piece of junk there. But then you have to go through and count them or pay someone with really good eyesight. So find one of your kids and tell them they can have a jelly bean for every mite they find or something like that. I'll give you a penny for every mite you find. That'll work once. I have counted 1,400 mites on a single bottom board one time. So we, we were testing chemicals and, and so we, were, we had to go through them all very, very accurately. So yeah, I, I could barely see by the end of that week. But uh, you wanna calculate your average mite fall per day. So you know if you have 300 mites over three days, that's 100 per day, so you calculate that. If you did it over four days or over two days, you have to adjust your, your math there. But this is not an, an estimate of your overall infestation. If you sample 300 bees and you have nine mites, then that's a 3% infestation. This one, you don't know how many bees are in that hive. You can kind of guess, but you don't really know. So. This isn't a good way to, to really calculate the infestation, but it's a really good way to compare the infestation level in a hive over time to itself. So as a beginning beekeeper, try this. Every two weeks or once a month, do this in your hive and make a record. Put this in your little bee notebook. You will be astounded at the rate at which mites start to collect over time, just in your first year and your second year. So. If you're new to this, do this, make these calculations, and it's really gonna make an impression on you about the, the season with these mites really build up and how quickly they can do that. You know, people wanna know what's the threshold for Varroa mites? And it's not an easy answer because there, there's really no absolute rule. It depends on what part of the country you're in, it depends on the time of year and the size of the colony. You know, a little nuke here, you sample that, you sample a big monster hive that's been established for years, that you're gonna have completely different numbers. But consider a mite treatment. This is kind of my personal, my rule of thumb. If you're doing a sugar sample of 300 bees, in the springtime, if you can find one to three, you wanna do something before the honey flow kicks in so that you can take care of this before it grows into a much bigger problem. Because if you let it go, by the time you harvest all your honey, you're gonna have a much larger mite population. But if you can knock a lot of those out early in the season, it's gonna prevent it from building up and, and being real dangerous. I would still sample again later on in the summer. And if you can find a 3% infestation rate, so nine or more mites in 300 bees, you wanna keep below that number. If you're using sticky boards, that's kind of iffy because it depends on the size of the hive, but for an average hive, you know, a couple of deep boxes, 40,000 bees or so. In the spring, three to 10 mites, you might want to do a spring treatment. In the fall, more than 40 mites a day, you might want to 
consider a treatment there. But again, you got to kind of consider all the things you know. So it comes down to your comfort level. If you can't sleep at night knowing that there was two mites on that sticky board, then do something about it. But if you're okay knowing what you know about your beehive and its genetics and your situation and your time of year, this is one of those judgment calls that you have to learn how to make as a beekeeper. So we've got all the science, but we, there's also the art to keeping bees. So it's, a, it's something that we have to kind of synergize all of these different things. So I would encourage you to err on the side of caution. A $4 mite treatment is a much better investment than letting a $200 nuke pass away because he didn't think, well, maybe I don't need to. I don't want to go all the way to the bee store. I don't want to order that. Well, maybe you should have invested $4 or $5. So. But, you know, that's up to you. There is, of course, the most popular method of mite control, which we covered earlier. We call it the 007 method or live and let die. Those are the people who don't treat. They put the bees in the box and they never look at them again because they didn't think they had to. And if you've got a beehive and it dies, you don't have to worry because all it takes is money. And there's so many rich beekeepers out there, right? They say if you want to keep your kids off drugs, give them a beehive and they won't have any more money. Somebody thought that was funny. <laughs> got a chuckle for that one. Maybe that was just a sympathy chuckle. If you've got a lot of hives and you really don't want to treat with medications and things like that, and you can stomach all those losses, you might have 90% loss the first year. But you can take the ones that survive and you can breed queens and you can make splits and you can do it again next year, maybe you've got 80% loss. The next year, 70. And pretty soon you're down to maybe 30% losses, which you would have if you were treating every year, every hive. You can get to that point. We call that breeding from survivor stock. And a lot of beekeepers have had success with this method, but they take a lot of losses early on. And you've got to be isolated from other beekeepers. This doesn't work so well if you're in town and there's a beekeeper every six blocks because those drones are out there flying around. But if you live way out in the middle of the Ozarks and you don't know of any other beekeepers around, you can start this process and over time you can really uh, develop some stock that other people will envy. And ultimately, breeding from survivor stock is going to be the saving grace of the entire beekeeping industry. It, it's going to be the sustainable method for controlling mites. There's a lot of people trying to breed these traits into bees, but we can't let 90% of the bees die and then hope for the best down the road. We need food, so we need our farms to be pollinated. And there's a lot of commercial beekeepers that are trying to make a living, and we can't tell them, uh, just let them all die and, and we'll figure it out later. Had we done that in the 80s, we probably would have lost a tremendous number of bees and the industry would have recovered by now much stronger, but we didn't. And, and you know, it's easy to say that now, but uh, it is what it is. But as long as we are, everybody is constantly putting these pesticides into hives, then we're breeding stronger pests that become resistant to these chemicals, but we're also breeding weaker bees that can't deal with the problem on their own. So it's gonna be the small to sideline beekeepers, breeding bees, boutique bee breeders that are producing things that and getting them out into the, the commercial population that that is gonna gonna probably change things. So, you know, people are working on it, but uh, we're not not quite there yet. These chemical treatments, they have their place. It's not something that we necessarily want to use, but it's something that sometimes we have to use. If you had cancer, you would probably want to have surgery and radiation treatments and things like that. You wouldn't do it for fun, but if it keeps you alive, that's the choice you would make. And so, you know, these, these medications may be a last resort, not a first choice, but we need them when, when we need them.